This morning, brothers and sisters, we have the our Lord God here in Exodus at chapter 6. I'd like to begin reading actually from the previous chapter for a bit more context where the Lord is first addressed by Moses. Moses had returned to Egypt, having been called by the Lord through the burning bush to go to Egypt to deliver the people of Israel out of slavery, out of bondage there in Egypt. And Moses and Aaron had gone to Pharaoh to tell him to say, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go. But Pharaoh refuses to acknowledge the Lord God and increases the workload. <clears throat> Instead, increases the workload upon the people of Israel. And the Israelites, rather than blaming Pharaoh, blamed Moses for this and brought it on account of Moses. Here in chapter 5, verse 22, Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he's done evil to this people. You have not delivered your people at all. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out. With a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves. I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. You shall know that I am the Lord, your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So the Lord said to Moses, go in. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me, for I am of uncircumcised lips? But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, have you ever had an opportunity to witness about Jesus, about, about his love for his people, but then felt your tongue go dry? A situation where it was possible to, to speak about your personal comfort in your Savior, but then the moment passes without having said anything. And then even afterwards, you reflect upon it, you think about it, and you convince yourself. And you write off the guilt and you think, what would have been the point anyway? It's not as though they were going to listen. It certainly feels true, doesn't it? After all, isn't it true that, that we can't even always convince ourselves? There's times when we have difficulties accepting the truths of God's holy word. And we struggle to accept that, that our God, He's in control. And especially so when there's terrible things that happen to us. It seems as though that we, that we strive in vain to, to, to maintain Christian values in a secular land. And if we who are the people of God, if, if we experience futility, is it not doubly so for unbelievers? That our words would only fall on deaf ears. And so we doubt. We doubt whether unbelievers will come to faith. We doubt our own place in God's plan. And we even doubt at times whether or not God is, is active in carrying out His plan. Beloved of Christ, in the face of our doubt, 
We have a mighty God who is faithful, who is enduring, who is certain. In the face of our doubt, our covenant God, He's the one who comes to us in love and He reveals Himself to us and He declares in no uncertain terms, I am the Lord. And this morning we have a blessed opportunity to consider that regardless of the futility of man, we may yet have confidence. Confidence not in ourselves, but in an unchanging God. We'll do so with the following theme and points. In the face of man's doubt, Almighty God declares, I am the Lord. We'll see that God reveals Himself, that God reveals His people, and that God reveals His plan. In the face of man's doubt, Almighty God reaffirms, I am the Lord. We'll consider first how God reveals Himself. Now, we've only read a few short words here from this middle chapter of the opening of Exodus. You may be familiar or less so with how the book of Exodus begins, how the people of Israel found themselves in a foreign land, how they had been placed under slavery by this pagan king, the Pharaoh. Moses had been raised in the household of Pharaoh, having been redeemed from death by the hand of our Lord God. And yet he had been driven from the land out of fear, for he had taken matters into his own hands. But the Lord in his time had called Moses to go to the land of Egypt to deliver the people of Israel from slavery. And yet things had only gotten worse upon his arrival. For the Israelites, they were still in slavery, and they had even more backbreaking work to do. That's the account of Exodus chapter 5. We had read together how Moses was so discouraged by the events that had unfolded that he, that he turned to the Lord in despair. His, his words had failed to convince Pharaoh to let the people go. And Pharaoh had responded with more than just a simple, no, they're not going to go. But he had instead, he had increased the torment that the Israelites were enduring. And rather than blaming Pharaoh, rather than blaming the Egyptians and their, and their whips, the Israelites had turned and they had pointed the finger at Moses. They blamed Moses for disturbing the peace. Overwhelmed, Moses turns and complains to the Lord, Why? Why did you send me? Why this evil? You haven't delivered your people. It's only gotten worse. But how does the Lord respond, beloved? Does the God of heaven and earth leave Moses in silence? Is he thwarted by the actions of Pharaoh? Is he stunned by this turn of events? Absolutely not. This is not what the Lord had in store. This too from His sovereign hand. He gives to Moses assurance by reaffirming who He is. He is both willing and able to accomplish salvation for Israel. The Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. And He reminds Moses of who it is that's going to do it. Look at how the Lord speaks to Moses here in these verses of Exodus chapter 6. Read here verses 2 through to 8, how he again and again reaffirms who he is. I am the Lord. When does he say that? He says that here in verse 2, I am the Lord. He tells Moses to say it again in addressing the people of Israel in verse 6, I am the Lord. That by his work they will know that I am the Lord your God. He concludes in verse 8, declaring, I am the Lord. Moses needs to remember that the God who called him to be his prophet to the burning bush, that was, he was still God with him in Egypt. He's unchanging. He's steadfast. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of generations past, and the God of generations to come is indeed 
the Lord, and he is with Moses there in the land of Egypt. Now, brothers and sisters, when you read the name Lord in all caps here in the Old Testament, that's, that's the covenant name of God in Hebrew, Yahweh, I am. God, Moses, God reminds Moses of this, that the I am who I am did not change in the time it took for him to travel to Egypt. I am who I am did not change despite what Pharaoh and the Israelite elders had responded whatever they might think or they might do. I am who I am is steadfast and unchanging. And it's because of this, because who, who, of who he is, that we have this very interesting comment here from the Lord. Here in verse 3, we read together, I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. Indeed, when God made a covenant of circumcision with Abraham, calling him Abraham in Genesis 17, he said to him, I am God Almighty. But these patriarchs, they indeed knew that God was Lord, that he was, I am who I am. You can read that as you go through the book of Genesis. Abraham acknowledged this in naming the mountain where Isaac would have been sacrificed. This was reaffirmed by the angel of the Lord. Likewise, in finding a wife for Isaac, he invoked the name of the Lord. Isaac also named a place Rehoboth, speaking of the Lord. He blessed his son Jacob in the name the Lord. After Jacob had said that the Lord gave success on the hunt. And there are other examples of this throughout the book of Genesis. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they all knew the name of the great I am of the Lord. Indeed, those who knew of them also knew of their God, who was the Lord. So why is it, beloved, that here, Exodus 6, verse 3, the Lord says to Moses, By my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. These men had a very special relationship with the Lord. They certainly knew their covenant God. But what the Lord's conveying to Moses is the power and the steadfastness of his name. For Moses and the Israelites, they're looking for God Almighty. God Almighty representing a powerful force, a strong arm, a hand of defeating any enemy. They would have been very happy if it was God Almighty descending upon the land of Egypt to defeat, to conquer their enemies, to give them victory. And the way that Pharaoh secretly feared the vast people of Israel, the way that he spoke of not knowing Moses, God, having complete disdain for this unknown entity, even this pagan king, he was anxiously waiting and expecting a mighty God. For God Almighty had established Abram in a foreign land. God Almighty had raised them up to power and had defeated pagan kings to deliver Lot and pay homage to Melchizedek, the priest king of Salem. God Almighty had caused the Abimelech and the Philistines to be filled with envy. God Almighty had showed his strength when Jacob became afraid of his brother Esau. God Almighty had caused the family of these patriarchs to go from one elderly couple into a great multitude of people. But who and what the Moses and the people of Israel were looking for was not how God would reveal himself at this time. The patriarchs and their close relationship with God, they could know his love and his steadfast faithfulness. The people of Israel, this mighty host, they needed to know more of this covenant God. They needed to be reminded that it was his plan unfolding, that they would be delivered according to his will, not theirs. The name of the Lord, the great unchanging, I am who I am. That needed to be made known to them. That is what was to be emphasized to the people of Israel. We see who the Lord is in this, beloved of Christ. 
that it's his steadfast faithfulness, not ours. That it's his covenant that he established, not us. We didn't establish it. It's his love. We only love him because he first loved us. It's his plan unfolding perfectly, not ours. Time, time again, the Lord must remind us who he is. After all, who doesn't wonder about God's plan? Who doesn't think about how things could unfold differently? Circumstances happen to us and we wonder, why did God allow such a thing to happen? What's the purpose behind this event in my life? How could God possibly want this to be a reality? We wonder why God Almighty doesn't just ride in on chariots of fire and save our lives here on earth. It's in this, it's in our circumstances that we are to be reminded again of who God is. I am who I am. This is the God that we may know. And it's significantly better for us that this is our God in the first place and not God Almighty. For who God is as the great and unchanging I am shines a light in the most beautiful way in how he reveals his people. So how can it be that the name our Lord, the great I am, was better for us than God Almighty? And we need to be careful here, brothers and sisters, on how we speak of this. For we may say here that the Lord is better for us, not that that name is intrinsically better. For our triune God has revealed himself as the Lord, and he has also revealed himself as God Almighty. It's not as though God has become greater and that he is therefore received a new name. It's not as though one element of who he is as God is, is greater, more worthy of praise than another. That's certainly not the case. And indeed, his name tells us that. I am who I am. He's unchanging. He's eternal. He's absolute. He's whole. He's perfect. He's one. And that he is eternal and unchanging and absolute means that he's also mighty and he's powerful his infiniteness it wouldn't be infinite if he weren't the most powerful being of all likewise a god cannot truly be almighty if he isn't eternal and unchanging who god is does not have us attempt to compartmentalize different attributes of god god is God. But this God enters into time and dialogues with man. He acts in his creation. He comes to his people and he reveals himself. He comes to us and for us, for our sake, for our benefit, he reveals himself as the Lord, the great I am. In speaking to Moses and reaffirming who he is as the Lord God, our gracious and merciful God reveals his people. For who is man before the Lord? How do people react to his word? Even such powerful words that, that testify about who God is and what he will do. How do the people of Israel respond, brothers and sisters? We read here, verse 9, Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen. They didn't listen to Moses because of their broken spirit, their harsh slavery. They didn't listen. They didn't respond in faith. Their backs were bent. Their faces looked down. All their eyes saw was Dirt, suffering, slavery. Are these the people of God? Are these the descendants of the men who had a close personal relationship with God Almighty? 
Are these the people whose forefathers defeated kings, who accumulated vast wealth, who contended with rulers, who even saved the world from famine? What sort of God do they have? And they were broken. Broken and destitute. Overwhelmed by their circumstances. And this indeed is how the second chapter of the book concluded. During those many days, the king of Egypt died. The people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Such a beautiful text. Shines as a light clear in the darkness of the slavery and the suffering of these opening chapters. It's beautiful how it focuses in on the plan, the action of the Lord as opposed to people. God heard. God remembered. God saw. God knew. Here, Exodus 6, God heard Israel was in slavery. God remembered and Israel in slavery. God saw Israel in slavery. God knew and still Israel was in slavery. The people of Israel did not listen when Moses came with such beautiful words from the great I Am because of their broken spirit, their harsh slavery. How could they? Look at their circumstances. They've been crying to the Lord for years. One king had died only to be replaced by another king who was worse. And now also Moses comes in and he's stirring the pot and things still worse yet. We today can so easily get frustrated with God we can wonder how God hears, how God remembers, how God sees and knows, and still, it doesn't seem as though He's doing anything. Why is it that the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? Why do bad things happen to little children? If He's God Almighty, where is He? How much longer must this world groan before Jesus returns? And will Jesus actually return? Or are we to continue enduring pain and suffering day after day after day? And if we're pushed hard enough, broken, we might even sympathize with those who end up leaving the church, who abandon the faith. What good is it to believe in a God who's never there? And this, brothers and sisters, is why such a passage like this may be such comfort to us. For Israel did have God Almighty on their side. He had a covenant with them, one established with their forefathers. And even though they despaired, even though their spirits were broken, their backs bent under slavery, that did not stop God from redeeming them. That did not stop him from saying, I am the Lord. He knows the weaknesses of his people. To that he says, I am the Lord. He knows that they, that we are not steadfast, that we're not enduring, and still, I am the Lord. He knows the spirits of the people are broken. But who he is remains unchanging. I am who I am. I am the Lord. God reveals His people in this promise. His people do not trust in Him because He's Almighty God. His people do not see His powerful hand at work and therefore want some of that help. His people are not those who've witnessed His strength and desire to harness it, to wield it, to put it to use according to their own ends and ambitions. No. His people, people of God, are His people because of His 
steadfast faithfulness, not because of his might. His people are his people because of his covenant love, not because they decided he is an ally worth having. Do you know this to be true? Do you worship Jesus as Lord and call upon God and love because of who he is? Or merely because of what you think he can do for you? It's a safe thing to hedge your bets on a powerful being. That just in case there is a God out there, I'd better come to church. And if I don't keep worshiping this God, then bad things will keep happening. But if I serve this almighty God, then, then he will bless me with peace, with happiness, with prosperity. And while God is indeed almighty, that's not why we worship him. We worship him because he loves us, because he's steadfast toward us, that he's unchanging and his promises are unchanging. And though we would despair, Though we would reject him, though we would be broken, he still keeps us. He calls us his people. He declares to us, I will take you to be my people and I will be your gods. That God is steadfast and faithful and certain in his covenant love cannot take away from his power as almighty God. As we were careful earlier to talk about God and his covenant love first and foremost and unchanging God and his love for us, so we must also be careful to remember he is God almighty. We lose sight of this so easily. Moses lost out of this. Verse 12, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. Let's be realistic here. The descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't listen. The covenant people of God don't listen. Even the elders are blaming Moses for the increased hardships. And now God still wants Moses to go and talk to a pagan king? A king who has already said that he doesn't know God. That he's shown his evil disregard for this God by torturing the Israelite slaves even more. Moses' objections may seem reasonable to us. But we must focus upon the activities not of man, but of God. For the God who had spoken to Moses saying, I am the Lord gave him and Aaron a charge. He commanded them to lead Israel out of the land of Egypt. It's important for us to see the significance of this charge that we read together. God had just told Moses that he is the Lord, the great unchanging I am. God has spoken of being God to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, not just as any God, but as Almighty God. He knows his people. He had said to Moses to tell the people that the Lord, the unchanging, the covenant remembering, I am who I am, would redeem them. That's more than just a simply an almighty God, but also a steadfast, faithful God would do it. He would do it with outstretched arm and great acts of judgment. For God has more than just the will to carry, to carry out his plan for his people as their covenant God, but also the ability to do so. He would do it in his method and at his time. Weak, sinful men like Moses and Aaron were charged with bringing the people out of slavery. And it would be clear that they would not do so by their own strength. They would not do so in their own time in accordance with their own plan even with their own words. And yet God's plan involved delivering Israel using two otherwise insignificant men who had been born of a couple living quietly as slaves. God's plan involved Israel being redeemed. They would be redeemed according to the Lord's plan, 
using two men charged by the Lord. It would become abundantly clear. Just as the covenant people of Israel did not listen to them, so also this pagan king would not listen to them. He wouldn't listen to them because of their words, because of their persuasive skills, because of their reasoning. Their words would be rejected. Their words would get them nowhere. Their words would cause them to despair. But their words, beloved, still a charge laid upon them by God. And though Israel certainly wouldn't be brought out by their words, God was still going to use them in His plan to redeem His people. The covenant Lord who is God Almighty has a plan that uses man in his weaknesses to do great things. He displays who he is through a plan that involves a charge laid upon sinners, upon men like you and me. Here in our text, it was Moses and Aaron. Though the Lord God could have redeemed Israel with a host of angels, send all his mighty heavenly host to defeat Pharaoh and lead the Israelites out in a glorious victory. Instead, he saw fit to use men who nobody would otherwise listen to. Indeed, this is how God displays his wisdom. All throughout the history of Israel, prophets came foretelling of redemption, of deliverance, that she would receive from a man that nobody would listen to. Prophets spoke of the plan to redeem Israel through someone the world would consider insignificant. The covenant God would remember His people, and a man appointed by God would deliver them for new life with blessed communion with Him. And the people would not listen to His words. And this man, just like Moses and Aaron had a charge laid upon him. Christ Jesus the Lord, anointed from the start of his ministry, beloved Son of God, came to do the will of his Father, denying his own will, even to the point of suffering death on the cross. He drank the cup of God's wrath in full. Rejected by man who did not know his word, who did not listen to him, he faithfully still brought the word of God. For he is the word of God. I am who I am, and his covenant love demonstrated his love not with a a great and glorious show of might and power, but in a beautiful display of humility. This is the plan of the Lord unfolding in time. The great I am has given us a church, beloved. Christ Jesus is at work calling his people out of darkness into his marvelous light. He is gathering his chosen people to be his people and his word must go forth unhindered. His covenant faithfulness is most beautifully realized in the humble followers of Christ carrying out their calling faithfully regardless of the opposition they face. Christians follow Christ as prophets, priests, and kings anointed and called to follow Him. This is their charge. This is our charge. And we're not doing it with with great displays of power. We're not doing it with powerful words that, that even the pagan kings and the rulers of our land would acknowledge it. We as the people of God are not bringing about His glorious kingdom with, with mighty works, with acts of judgment, not in the eyes of man. But the gathering of God's people is being done. And it's being done not according to our plan, our ambitions, our perfections, but according to His plan. Almighty God reaffirms to us, I am the Lord. His perfect work has been so wonderfully accomplished in Christ Jesus. How can we doubt the charge that He would lay upon us? 
How are we to question what, how effective we'll be in the eyes of man? Whether or not the person we're talking to, witnessing to, inviting to church, if it seems to fall on deaf ears, would we question still the hand of the Lord? We may think it would be easier if God were simply to give to us powerful signs and wonders so that our message of salvation won't be so easily dismissed and denied. But to us, the Lord affirms, I am the Lord. In the face of our doubts, I am the Lord. God reaffirms who He is, that He's a covenant God, that He's a faithful God, a steadfast God who's unchanging, unwavering in His purpose, I am the Lord. God reaffirms to us, His people, that, that we didn't choose Him. He chooses us. I am the Lord. God affirms that it's His plan unfolding throughout history, not ours. And in that perfect plan, we have a role, a calling, a mandate. And what a glorious, comforting mandate it is, beloved. That in the face of all the chaos, the uncertainty, the doubts of the world, of society around us, before all the uncertainty of life in the 21st century compared with the confusion of society with all of its questions and lack of answers, we humbly, peaceably, as the people of God may testify, not us, but there is indeed an almighty God whose word is certain, absolute, and unchanging. I am the Lord. I am. Amen. Let's come before this God in prayer. Almighty God, you reveal to us yourself as the Lord, as the I am who I am. Great, unchanging, steadfast, enduring. A God who establishes a covenant that reflects who you are steadfast and enduring. Help us, O Lord God, to cling to your promises, therefore. Help us, O Lord God, to remain steadfast in who you are and not in ourselves. For, Lord, we readily confess before you the doubts that we experience, how quickly we would be overwhelmed, swept out to the seas of chaos in this life overthrown and overwhelmed by the trials and the temptations that life here in Canada would give to us. Grant to us, O oh Lord God, that we can turn our eyes from the void that is civilization fallen in the hearts of man and turn to you to seek refuge, and seek comfort, to seek solace in who you are as a covenant, gracious, merciful God, the Lord. Lord, we ask you to give to us your spirit, to surround us with your love and your care, to reassure us in the face of our own doubts. Lord, bless us as we interact with each other, that in humility we can show to each other the steadfastness of your word, that even when we ourselves fall short, even when we commit sins against each other, even when we are unable to do what you would ask us to do, that we may seek repentance and forgiveness and also of each other. Lord, that we do not reject each other in the words that we would bring, words grounded in your holy words that we may accept one another. Allow us, O oh Lord, to fulfill the charge that you lay upon us, that we do so not in the strength that we have, not in the words and the persuasive skills that we may have, but in what you bestow upon us. Give to us, O oh Lord, the words that are necessary to build each other up, to strengthen and to encourage each other, and we may extend the same grace you extend to us. Lord, grant that this word may strengthen and build up your people also here in adoration, 
week by week for, oh Lord, it is so easy to become overwhelmed by the circumstances of this life. May you allow this congregation to be faithful to your word, for Lord, apart from your spirit indwelling their hearts, they would speak the same as the people of Israel did, and to your messenger, and they would peg the blame upon your words and upon you and the one whom you sent. Grant that they may receive your word in faith and in grace and in blessing by your spirit. Be also with the one who brings that word faithfully week by week. We ask you to be with the pastor of this congregation, Reverend Desvart. We thank you for the time that he may have to be refreshed and reinvigorated. Lord, that he has opportunity to visit with his family. Give to him also traveling mercies, that in due time he may also be restored to us here in adoration. Lord, that your word may continue to go forth unhindered. Give to him the boldness to speak not his own word, but the words that you would give to your people through your holy words from this pulpit. Lord, may you therefore grant that this congregation may shine as lights also in this community, that more and more people here in Vineland may come to know who you are as a sovereign and gracious and unchanging eternal God, that the solution to their uncertainty and their circumstances are not found in the answers of society, that they're not found on the internet, that they're not found in the words of weak and sinful men. Be they teachers or therapists, employees, employers, or those in politics, whether they are premiers or prime ministers, our representatives, O oh Lord. May you therefore also be with those that are in authority over this land, a grant that they may recognize that you indeed are unchanging, the I am who I am, and that true salvation can only be found in Christ Jesus, your Son, and not in the promises that they might speak to the people of this land. Lord, grant to us that we may depend upon you, not seeking to work change according to our own timelines, according to our own plans, according to what we think should happen, Give to us peace and patience to recognize that it is your plan unfolding in history. Still our souls within us. These things we lay before you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, in whom we have absolute certainty that your promises are steadfast. Amen. <laughs>